Hey, what's going on, folks? It's your boy BQ here. It's been a while. It's been a long time since I have let my voice be heard on the channel. So this is the B side. I'm going to do my best to do this every week. But like last week, had some real serious family stuff go down, so I wasn't able to do it. But I'm going to do my best to talk on Impact every week. But first things first, viewership went up 31,000. Now, obviously, in a bigger wrestling company that's got millions of viewers, that means actually nothing. But in the in the case of Impact, where we're you know in the in the ballpark, three hundred thousand every week, you know, thirty one thousand is pretty good. Um, a, a good direction to trend upwards. Now, Josh Matthews has said uh, on the teleconference a couple weeks ago that the viewership is usually about the same. You know, once you factor DVR and everything like that in, but it's it's usually about the same. So. I try to tell people don't get too caught up on, you know, those weeks that that's 280,000, 260,000 or whatever, because for the most part, these people are watching it on, on, um, uh, DVR. Now, overall episode, I saw on social media was getting a lot of positive feedback from the fans. I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't really care for this episode and there's, there's a few reasons and we'll get into that, obviously, as I as I go through the show and break it down. Now, with the B-side, I break down the Impact impact show. It's, it's more of an Impact wrap-up. Like, I just run through it real quick. If you want to check out the long review, check the channel for Roe and Adam and their review that they just did. So, it's uh, already on the channel. And they go real in-depth reviewing the show. But for me, I'm just wrapping it up. But I didn't really care for the episode. I, I guess the two main reasons were... The Tessa Blanchard Kiera match and the main event. Both these matches were obviously filmed later in the night. And if you don't know how Impact films, they don't actually film the show in order that you see it on TV. They actually bounce around a lot. I don't really know the reason for that, but they do do that. And both these matches, which were important matches, were obviously done at the end of the night. They didn't really black out the crowd like they normally do. So the crowd was real thin and it was... For me, as a fan, really embarrassing to watch and very hard to watch and something I couldn't stop focusing on. If I know Impact, and I think I do, I'm sure a lot of, I'm sure they released, I haven't been on social media a whole lot lately. I'm sure they released a lot of photos from those matches with uh, the thin crowds in the background. I really liked the opening recap package that they did. I, I really didn't care for the old one where it was showing you know, the AAA and Noah logos and all that. I, I thought that was cool one time. But I kind of didn't like it, watching it over and over. I really liked how they kind of recapped the previous week this time. I thought that was pretty good. But they need to settle on how they want to open the show because it seems like it's always different. DJ Z and Andrew Everett, I really think they make an excellent team. And we're always talking for makeshift tag teams. You know, throw two guys together who aren't doing a whole lot. So this was perfect. I'd like to see their outfits match a little bit more. Now, I know their ring gear, like semi-matches. But when they come down to the ring and DJ Z has the flashy outfit and then um, Everett just has that regular jacket, they don't match at all. So I like to see that match a little bit more. This is probably the last we've seen of Scott Steiner. I really felt he was competing at a fairly high level given his age and his abilities. But we didn't just see him wrestle at Redemption. We got to see the rematch with LAX. And then we got, we got to see this match too. So... Unlike the slam anniversary of last year where he didn't really do much, we actually saw him compete quite a bit this time around. I really feel like Andrew Everett is botch proof. Everything he does, I don't want to call it crisp because he's he's flailing his body's flailing all over the place, but he's just very accurate with what he does. But I never feel like he's gonna botch anything when he does when he does it. It seems like him and DJ Z are really set on introducing a new offense, and that's what's making this uh, really, really interesting. And the tag team division is really starting to heat up. Didn't see that title change coming at all. And I mean, I guess looking back, I could see why it happened. And it was probably a pretty obvious title change. But at the time, I didn't see it. I, I just can't believe they put the titles on them so quickly. But that's something that Impact does. Frankly, the other companies do it too, to an extent. But I Impact's always done it. You, you get a shiny new toy and you just you just can't help but to throw those straps on. You know, they did it with Decay, did it with LAX. Obviously, they have a long history of changing the world title uh, very quickly to uh, 
prior WWE guys or, or new talents. Like the fact that Brian Cage is not the champion right now actually blows me away. But they kind of have a history with uh, getting shiny new objects and putting the titles on them. But we wanted to see gold on Andrew Everett for quite some time, and now he's got it. Eli Drake doesn't feel like someone who's re-signing with the company. He feels like he's being booked much like uh, Mike Bennett was towards the end. Remember, Mike Bennett lost a lot. He lost to Braxton Sutter. He lost twice to Moose, and he was getting his ass kicked by Robbie E. at the end of the wedding. So he doesn't feel like someone who's going to be re-signing. You can take what I say. You can take it or leave it. When I tell you um, that a source has told me something, you can tell me I don't know what the hell I'm talking about and I'm just a fan just like the rest of you. Or you can believe me when I say I talk to people. For the most part, when I drop a rumor, it's usually correct. You know, Sometimes it's wrong because either things change or it was a bad rumor. But for the most part, I feel like I know what I'm talking about. And a lot of rumors do come my way that I don't talk about. For example, how would you have liked if I dropped a video uh, three weeks ago to tell you that LAX almost didn't resign with the company and they were leaving? Would you would you have liked that? Would you have liked me talk about talking about a knockout that almost left for NXT? You probably don't want to hear a lot of the stuff that I hear, but a lot of people have been asking me about Eli Drake, and I wasn't going to say anything. But from what I'm told, there's a it could change, but it's more likely he is leaving than staying. He's been, from what I'm understanding, he's actually been in contact with WWE for the last year. That doesn't mean they've been negotiating a deal. That just means there's been dialogue. And I guess they brought him in to do the video game. Um, I don't think it was this year's, the one coming out this year. It, it might have been the one last year. But they brought him in to do, I don't even know what you call it. We you know when they like uh, strap up the little pads to you and you do the moves and it transfers to the game, whatever. I'm not really a gamer, so I can't uh, give you the correct terminology. But he either did that last year or this year. So there's been a lot of dialogue. So I am just told it's more more, more than likely he's out than uh, staying. But if you see the way he's booked, especially that uh, match with Pentagon last, last week, that doesn't feel like someone who's going to be around long term. So let's cross our fingers and hope that d that does happen. Another thing I'm kind of being told is that uh, they're trying to be done with Orlando. Um, either they are done or they're looking to be done. But it, from what I'm understanding, they're just trying to get on the road full time now when they're doing Impact. So we'll see if that comes to fruition or not. I'm not a big fan of the green screen stuff that Josh Matthews does. He's been doing it with Sanjay and now obviously, obviously he had Madison Rain this time around. I'm not a big fan of it. It feels like primetime wrestling. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Primetime Wrestling was the show that came out. I mean, that was broadcasted on Monday nights before Raw came into existence. It was a two-hour show. It was uh, it was essentially like watching Explosion, you know, but it was a bunch of exclusive matches, lots of recaps. Um, it was hosted by Gorilla and Heenan and Hillbilly Jim and Mr. Perfect and uh, Hacksaw. You know, they kind of had a little group that, that rotated out. And they were at like a little round table. So they used to do like little discussions, um, things like that. But you just knew that nothing was going to happen when you were watching those. You know, it just it just felt like a second rate show. And when Josh does that, it just seems like he's like, all right, and stay tuned for a knockouts title match. You know, like it just it's, there's no conviction in his voice that what we're going to see is, is going to be excellent or, or anything. I think it was last week when they did the opening segment. With uh, Don Callis and Sammy Callahan, I thought that was really good. But I thought, and I, I'm a big Josh Matthews fan, but I thought he, I thought he just kind of looked like a tool. The way he was like all serious and, oh, what you're about to see is, uh, you know, I, I'm just not buying it. I'm not buying the whole green screen thing. I would like to see them get away from that. Kiera Hogan has the potential to be a real star for this company. When she first signed, I felt like she had MJ Jenkins slash Ava Story written all over her. Someone who came in and we were going to kind of get excited getting to know her but in all honesty they had nothing to do with her and then she was just going to be gone six months later the crowd is really behind her and she really wants to be there which is awesome speaking of star though tessa blanchard oozes star potential i was really jazzed for this match i wasn't a fan of madison rain on commentary previously like last year when she was on but 
I liked her this time around. I thought I thought she really added something. Previously, I didn't think she was adding much. She was just kind of talking. Maybe now that it's a two-man booth, she's able to do her thing. But as I said earlier, it was obvious this match was taped later in the night. The crowd was really thin. It was embarrassing to watch as a fan. And Tessa deserved more than that for her debut. Typically, they'd turn the lights down. It didn't really seem that they did. But I want to say Kiera Hogan, this was probably the best we've seen her look. Her offense is still a little clunky, but this was the best she looked. And Tessa's finisher, that looks dangerous. That looks like it hurts. It looks like she almost took Kiera's arm out of her socket. I think her spray tan is a little orange, but besides that, she is looking amazing. And she is, she's a beast. That girl has, oh my gosh. When I saw her in person at WrestleCon, I was just so impressed with her physique. But she looks absolutely amazing. She's an absolute monster. And I can't wait for her to wrestle someone in the ring who's more more on her level. I thought it really made sense for Madison Rain to come out in the manner that she did. What I didn't like is that she came out to absolute crickets. Now there are regulars there, obviously, in the front row. You could at least act like you haven't seen Madison Rain in over a year. They gave her absolutely nothing. That really bothered me a lot. And was kind of one of the reasons I didn't care for the show. But I thought it made sense for her to come out. What I would have liked to see happen is Tessa have several matches. You know, they could have thrown her Amber Nova. They could have thrown her a couple of other local talents where she's just dominating. And then she's bullying them after the match. And then on the way back to the, you know, backstage, she kind of catches eye contact with Madison Rain every time. And lets her know you ain't shit. And then finally Madison just cracks and comes down. That would have been a really better way to do it for some long-term storytelling. But in two weeks at Under Pressure, we are getting the two of them one-on-one. So that should be really good. I think the backstage attacker gimmick is really cool. I can't wait to see who emerges. doesn't look like it's going to be Kill Shot because he signed a MLW. And they have a similar deal like the other wrestling companies do where you cannot appear on TV with another company. So that's actually kind of weird because Impact's not even doing that right now. But it doesn't look like it's going to be Shane Strickland. But I can't wait to see who it is. I want to say props to Katarina for the way she caught Grado's glasses when they accidentally fell off his head. I really liked what she was adding to the Grado character in these you know, backstage segments. I like what she was adding a lot. She looks amazing, by the way. Back when she was like Katie Lee Burchill before she was Winter, I didn't really think she was that attractive. Um, but with age, she looks absolutely phenomenal. Grado and Kong had a match. Can't believe that Grado got Kong off his feet. That was a little odd to me. Congo Kong wins the match, and then and then Katarina leaves after. She leaves Grado high and dry. I kind of felt like that was probably going to happen at some point. Didn't really expect it to happen so quickly, though. Like, his second match. You know, I thought they could have played that out, drag it out a little bit. And maybe they will. Maybe she's going to apologize. But I really liked what they were going with it, with it where she was going to be that female that tries to change the guy. Because a lot of us can relate to that. So I hope they still go that direction. I guess we're going to see. But that happened a little quick. I like the idea of a Congo Kong and Moose feud. They've been doing such a good job building Kong. But now it's like, is Kong going to win this? Is he going to keep the momentum? Or is Moose going to be taking that next step up to the world title? Really good Cult of Lee and LAX segment backstage. I wish they didn't do the LAX music, the clubhouse music, because they weren't at the clubhouse. And I kind of find that music annoying. So I wish they kind of just had them backstage. But looking forward to the the uh, advancement with LAX. Dreamer, this was another segment of the show I actually didn't like. And this was it was the Eddie Edwards and Sammy Callahan match. Tommy Dreamer, I don't know what his role is in this whole thing. But he told Eddie, when you win, it's done. It's over. I thought the biggest mistake they could have done that really halted momentum in this whole thing was to take it to another match. Especially a match that Eddie Edwards won. And a match that wasn't even in the impact zone. So last week, I really thought it was very disappointing the way they built it up the whole show. Only for them to say, okay, Eddie, we're not going to fire him. Even though it took the entire show almost for them to decide to fire him. Okay, but it's not going to happen here. We all know these House of Hardcore matches and all that stuff don't happen in conjunction with the show. We know it happened like weeks ago. I guess the tapings did too technically, but you know where I'm going with it. So I, I just, I wasn't a big fan that they took it to the ring. 
I thought there was so much more storyline advancement they could have done with the use of Alicia. Or maybe Eddie Edwards gets a couple, couple solo matches, single matches with OVE or something like that where he continues to just snap and he just has to get his hands on Sammy again. Like there's so much more progression they could have done rather than put the two of them in a ring together. So to me, this match meant absolutely nothing and really halted the momentum. But we're going to see what happens going forward. I don't mind the Brian Cage stuff that they're doing. The Destiny World fans actually react to things, which is really cool. The Weapon X is a really nasty finisher. So I'm kind of digging the Brian Cage stuff. I personally find the Fala Ball and KM stuff to be absolutely hilarious. I think the Impact haters would probably despise it. But I love KM. And I think it's funny. So I'm curious. Do you guys think it's funny? I thought Kiera's reaction was really cute too when uh, Fala Ball kind of walked up on her. But I'm, I'm digging that stuff. I think KM's obviously going to turn on him at one point. But this is kind of some good comedy that I think the show needs. The Under Pressure card looks excellent. I really like the name. And I like that they're actually building it up, building it up a couple weeks in advance. Because you remember, you know, a year or so ago, they would be like, next week is Genesis. And it's like, wait, what? You know, no kind of build whatsoever. You know, it was just the name of the show. But now they make it feel a little bit more special. And I kind of like the special shows. And the card they're putting together is, is pretty good. Kind of digging it. Was really looking forward to that funeral segment with Rosemary. That was amazing. I watched that a couple times. Killer. The Undead Brides do a really good job. They're very committed to acting like Sue Young does. And I never expected Sue Young to be... On a mainstream promotion. I, I really didn't. Now I feel like she's made for television. I really love what she was doing. How some people were saying it's a rip off the, of The Undertaker. I don't remember the last time Undertaker did anything like that. And these are females. And it's a completely different character. And just because there's a coffin involved. Doesn't mean it's a, a knockoff of The Undertaker. Sue Young has had this character for years. And it makes a lot of sense writing Rosemary off TV. So they did a really good job writing her off uh, until she's back from her injury. But the segment was just great. It was creepy. I just can't believe she's getting a title shot this quickly against Allie. I really thought they were going to try to build it up towards Slammiversary. That's what I would have really done if I was the guy calling in the shots. I would have continued to build the Allie character. Because you remember a couple weeks ago, they did the bathroom segment where she was in there and there was the the stuffed animal that came with a note. We didn't know what the note says. We said we still don't know what the note says. They didn't shed any kind of light on that this week. I would have liked a good few weeks of alley character progression. You know, make her snap a little bit. Make her get a little tough. Take the alley character. Get a little more serious over the next few weeks. Because this is the perfect time to do it. Because you know you got to do it at some point. This is the perfect time. That's what I really would have liked to see. And then the Sue Young match happened at the pay-per-view. So the fact that we're getting it this quickly, I think is really rushed. Last thing, main event. Can't believe Pentagon came out with the world champion before the X Division champion and the grand champion. That is an unwritten rule that the world champion comes out last. I got to say this. This Pentagon title run has been awful. They, you know, I think they created some buzz with it. I don't know that they added any, any extra viewers. I mean, Pentagon Jr. is one of the coolest wrestlers there is. And they haven't appeared to generate any additional buzz yet. Maybe they did. I don't I don't really know. But overall, the, I was excited for the title run. You know, they said this is the era of Pentagon. We haven't gotten a video package. We haven't got anything. How are you not giving... They're giving us video packages all the time. We're not getting one for Pentagon Jr., the world champion. I know my voice sounds a little bit funny. It keeps cracking from time to time. I am not feeling good. I have got a very bad cough that I'm doing my best to hold in as I talk to you. So every once in a while, my voice cracks a little bit. So my apologies for that. But no video package, no nothing. We didn't get a reason not one time to care for Pentagon Jr. when he would come out. And again, you got one of the coolest wrestlers. And every time he starts in the ring, he gets in the face and does a saddle miedo. It's an it sucks because I was really happy for Pentagon to come aboard. This has just been the worst, the awful world title reign. And frankly, in the last 
couple years. You know, EC3 had that title for a long time, and that was a great title reign. But since EC3 dropped it, the only good world title run has been Lashley. And I'll even say Matt Hardy's was okay. I didn't really like his opening segments talking all the time, but for the most part, I thought his world title run was okay. But Drew Galloway's was no good. Um, if he would have done it as a heel, because he was building a lot of momentum as a heel towards the end, I think that would have been good. Um, who else? Eddie Edwards, I thought was okay, but you know, a lot of people didn't really care for that one. The Austin Aries run was okay, but it was short. The, I didn't think the Eli Drake title reign was all that, mainly because he had that ugly-ass title, and I just couldn't stop focusing on that damn belt. But we just haven't had a good world champion. They, they got to figure out a way to make him seem important because right now that title to me feels like it means nothing. And they got a great title now. I don't know what they're going to figure out. But I know Roe was always saying he expects Moose to hold the title soon or get a title. But I want Moose to be champion. But I'm talking about these other guys who have pretty underwhelming title runs. Moose doesn't have the charisma to be a better world, better world champion in some of these. That's just kind of my opinion. I want to see Moose get that shot eventually. But uh, I don't know if I'm ready for it quite yet. But the match was cool. Um, you know, Phantasma was in there. I can't believe they replayed the botch when Phantasma dro dove through the ropes. And then they played it again when he got tripped up. Tripped up. Why did they do that? I don't know. But the match was pretty cool. Overall, though, I was just I was just kind of bored with the show. I don't remember if they did a GWN match or not. I'm pretty sure they did. I, I tend to tune them out. But a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago, I loved the show. Last week's I thought was pretty good. This one didn't do a whole lot for me. And uh, there were there were moments, you know, the Sue Young thing was really good. And the you know, opening tag match was pretty solid. Even the main event was, was pretty decent. But I couldn't get over the thin crowds. And uh, yeah... I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm disagreeing with a lot of you. A lot of you really liked the episode. I, I I just didn't. And I'm doing my best to be honest with you guys. So thanks for listening to the B-side, folks. Uh, as I said, I'm going to try to do this every week if I can. But I'm obviously scaling down quite a bit on the channel. And uh, the channel's pretty much just going to be reviews and interviews going forward. There's not going to be a whole lot of news and rumors. And that's been a, you know, a few people have been disappointed with that. But with my personal life, I just cannot dedicate that right now. But thanks for listening to the B-Side, folks, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Peace.